Reflections. I'm Andrea Solka. And first, I want to thank the faith leaders who have graciously joined us this evening to be on our panel. Ms. Debbie Gonzalez from St. Anne's Catholic Parish, Mohammed El Mugi from the Islamic Center of Capel, Rabbi Adam Rothman from Congregation Sheriff Israel, and Ms. Carla Sperne Spernade 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 I knew I would butcher someone's name, I apologize, uh, from the Baha'i faith. This event is co-sponsored by both the Capel Allies and Faith and Community Builders. I want to share briefly about the two uh, communities. The Capel Allies and Faith was formed by Capel residents who took part in the Allies in Community, which is a program the city started that builds relationships through common ground, fosters a deep sense of belonging, and enhances residents' engagement with the city of Capel. The mission of Allies in Faith is to learn about faith represented in our city and to improve dialogue in our community on matters of faith. And Community Builders is a program of the Capel Library whose mission is to enhance the awareness of the community's diversity through collaborative partnerships. And the Community Builders Committee consists of both city staff and community members interested in ways to promote cultural inclusivity and diverse programming for all members of the Capel community. I wanna thank the community builders for co-sponsoring this event with the allies. Tonight, we're happy to have faith leaders join us to reflect on the impact of COVID on their congregations and the community at large. Each faith leader will share how their congregation was impacted during the past year and how it changed many aspects of the way we live and pray. We'll start or I'll start by asking each faith leader to introduce themselves and then we're going to move to a question and answer session. If you have a question, uh, those of you in our audience, I'd please ask that you post that in the chat and we will try to answer them at the end of our program. I'm now going to ask each faith leader to please introduce themselves, share a brief overview of their religious view of the pandemic. And if you would like to share a prayer of healing or a prayer for the departed or a prayer that speaks to the trials and tribulations we've all gone through with this pandemic. I'm gonna start by asking uh, Ms. Debbie Gonzalez if you could please introduce yourself and share a prayer. Yes, my name is Debbie Gonzalez and I work at St. Anne Catholic Church in Capel. Um, and so just a, the prayer for now, Andrea? Or you'd you also just like to speak about um, your religious view, the real Catholic religious view of the pandemic. And then also, if you'd like to share a prayer, please. Okay, fine. Um, so I, my role at, at St. Anne is under leadership and mission. And so very quickly, um, as, as probably many of you also did in your own communities, realizing the very, just the reality of, of COVID as it was coming into our communities and wanting to shift as quickly as possible um, as soon as we knew that in-person gathering was not going to be a possibility for an indefinite amount of time me personally i thought it was i thought maybe by may we'd be okay um, i was probably in a bit of denial um, just being honest there um, but we very much quickly shifted into still wanting to be a presence um, for our community and for those outside of our community as well. We already had a digital presence, but probably not very developed. Um, very, we are, were a vibrant parish that had activity every single evening. Um, the parking lot was always full. So to shift from in-person to now digital, um, just it was, it was a necessary step but it was also a little painful, I'll have to say. But from the get-go, we wanted to impart um, to those that were connected to our community um, that to have the idea that this is the time to lean on your faith when times are so uncertain. And certainly the reality of illness and potential death, um, which we were hearing about, um, to not be afraid that this was the time um, to lean on our faith and God's promises, that he is faithful to his people, to his children. 
um, and just really clinging on to that to that belief and so very early on we did videos just messaging of encouraging people um, to not give in to the fear um, to live with anxiety um, so much as to lean more into their faith to lean more into prayer and to lean more into community and to start connecting with one another so if you were feeling anxious or depressed um, or just couldn't get out to lean on your neighbors and lean on your community um, so we really took that stance um, not so much of is this a test of faith is this something that um, is a lesson that God is, is coming to show us so much as we don't know what this is yet we don't know the full scope of it all we know is that God is faithful and he has promised to be faithful and we must latch onto that and we must cling to that as much as possible and so that is the stance that we took that's the position that we took in all of our messaging we kept repeating that over and over and offering times of prayer digitally and we knew that that was awkward and we just spoke into that like this feels a little weird speaking to a screen versus in person holding hands all of that and just the desire to want to be with one another when times were so uncertain and how much we longed for community and what a privileged community is. And so th those were just basically the, the approach that we took. Thank you. Um, Mohammed, would you mind introducing yourself? And Mohammed is uh, a representative from our Islamic Center of Capel. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, just a disclaimer, I'm not a faith leader. Uh, I actually come on behalf of Imam Abdullah, who had that emergency to attend you today, unfortunately. And we pray for a speedy recovery for his mother. Uh, but I do, uh, do uh, inv I'm involved in the uh, outreach activities in the Islamic Center of Kapel. Uh, so I'm here as such. Uh, in our case, in the Islamic faith, the pandemic really uh, hit us hard. Uh, one of the reasons uh, we have almost centers that it seems to be spreading everywhere, particularly in the DFW, DFW area and all that, because we have a special link uh, to our uh, mosques or Islamic centers, whereas uh, many of us go pray five times a day there. So you actually leave your house and, and you know, and you get more rewards uh, you know, multiple rewards if you pray there. So a lot of people do that, particularly the senior uh, crowd in our congregation, because obviously they have the time and the ability to do that. Uh, of course, we have to shut down the center. Uh, we, in our case, on the faith standpoint, relied on uh, stories from the day of our prophet, where there are many sayings that relate to if you are in a city where you are inflicted by the plague, you are not to leave the city, and for those outside of the city, you are not to go into the city. So that kind of rang a tone with the, uh, the, the rationale uh, of really uh, isolating ourselves and, you know, social distancing and, and, and the like. Uh, and of course, we try to utilize the, as it's, I'm sure everybody did that, the internet, uh, to have daily uh, we call it short, uh, you know, words of wisdom or reminders, as we like to call it in our faith from our imam uh, that was out on Facebook. We do have a WhatsApp group that we communicate a lot through that. Try to kind of ease the isolation that a lot of people were feeling uh, at the time. And of course, to ease the fact that they can't even come to the mosque, which is a first in our life, at least in, I'm 61 years old. It's not something that we've ever experienced anywhere where you cannot go to a mosque or a mosque is shut down. And I suspect the same stands true for everybody. So uh, we also em employed the services of some uh, counselors. And uh, so we have extra sessions uh, that we have weekly and it was geared towards the families. Uh, so to ease the burden and the uh, conflicts that might arise from having everybody locked down husband wives nobody's going to work children 24 7. so we were doing like you know weekly counseling sessions online you know to kind of 
help some of these conflicts that may arise because of the isolation. And I'll stop at that because I can go on for hours, obviously. But. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I'd ask Rabbi Adam Rothman now to share our religious view of the pandemic and a prayer if you wish. And you're muted. I know, I put my <laughs> put something in front of my mute button and I had to figure out how to move it out of the way. So good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Rabbi Adam Moffman. I'm one of the three rabbis. I work with my colleagues, Rabbi Shira Wallach, who happens to be my wife, and Rabbi Ari Sunshine at our uh, large congregation in North Dallas, uh, which is not in Capel. So if you've brought me here this evening to invite me to open up a satellite in Capel, I'm happy to talk about that. I'm also happy to just represent the, the, the 70,000 plus uh, Jews in the DFW area. Um, you know, I'll, I'll echo a lot of what um, Debbie and, and Mohammed said in that, number one, we, we, since the pandemic started, we haven't really spent a lot of time asking, why is this happening to us? We've spent much more time saying, what is it that we're going to do about it? And, uh, and similar to Mohammed, that we, you know, Jews are a, a people of regularity, of habit. And um, we have daily services in our synagogue that meet uh, once in the morning and once in the evening, and of course, uh, even more so on, on holidays. And uh, the complicating, additional complicating factor there is that Judaism is a, a legal religion. It's a religion of laws. And one of the laws tells us that there are certain things that we can't do, for example, on the Sabbath. There's a number of, there's a 39 distinct categories of labor. Some of them involve things like writing and, and other things that are pretty much you can't do with, with, with you know, uh, on sh normally on Shabbat. So we had to ask ourselves the question, are we going to suspend these rules the way that Jews have been keeping the Sabbath for thousands of years um, to meet the needs of the moment? And uh, for some of us, this was a very uh, heart-wrenching decision, um, but it was immediately apparent after we made it that it was the right one, which is to say that I found myself doing many things that I never would have imagined on the Sabbath in the sanctuary, right? You know, going, uh, it, never, never could I have ever imagined walking up to a computer and typing in something on a screen um, on, on Shabbat. I mean, that, that is just crazy. Or sitting, or sitting in my living room and doing the same, you know, kind of broadcasting services from my, from my piano room, from my music room. Uh, uh, one of the things that's also come up here is, um, you know, what do you do about the fact that um, for many of our folks who you know, have been coming back to the synagogue year after year after year for the same services, like the high holiday services on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, who come up to you after this year where we were entirely digital um, and say to you, wow, that was the most fulfilling experience of high holiday services I've ever had in my life. So that, you know, that's a really challenging statement. Uh, first, you know, we had to pat ourselves on the back for doing a really good job of keeping our community together and leveraging technology, which I think is about 30 or 40 percent of my job now is working on technology, um, both for having myself and on behalf of the larger community. But but what do we do about the fact that pe there are certain aspects of this that people like much better than coming to the synagogue um, because their rabbi was right there on the screen talking to them as opposed to sitting in the back of a 600 seat uh, sanctuary? Um, so again, well, I could also go on forever, but those are kind of the large, some of the larger themes that we've been thinking about over the past year. Thank you. And last but not least, Ms. Carla Sparandeo from you. the Baha'i Faith, if you could share the Baha'i perspective on, on the pandemic, please. Sure. Uh, yes, my name is Carla Sparandeo and I am a member of the Baha'i Faith. Uh, I am also not a faith leader. Uh, there was actually no clergy in the Baha'i faith. And um, as far as a brief overview of the Baha'i view of the pandemic, uh, from the Baha'i view, the pandemic is one of many challenges that humanity must endure to achieve an ultimate purpose. And that purpose is the complete unification of the entire human race. Uh, Baha'is view the various problems, the sufferings, the bewilderment of humanity uh, like we're experiencing in the, in the pandemic in the light of God's purpose for mankind and in light of how we may achieve that purpose. So the question that Baha'is are thinking about is what is the relationship between the pandemic and God's purpose? And what are we doing amidst this pandemic to achieve God's purpose, which is again, the unity of mankind. 
I would like to offer a short healing prayer, I really on behalf of every single person who has gone through a great deal of illness and as well as family members uh, serving as caregivers. This is a prayer revealed by Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. And it goes, thy name is my healing, oh my God. And remembrance of thee is my remedy. Nearness to thee is my hope. And love for thee is my companion. Thy mercy to me is my healing and my succor in both this world and in the world to come. Thou verily art the all bountiful, the all knowing, the all wise. Thank you very much. So my first question I was gonna ask of all of you, I think you've touched on it some. So I'm gonna ask it anyway, and <clears throat> if you could elaborate. And um, if we can start with Ms. Um, um, Muhammad, I will start with you. I'll try to change up the order. So what was the impact of COVID on your congregation? I think you all talked to that, but how did your congregation um, conduct prayer services D during the pandemic? How did you change and how did you adapt to not being in, pers in person? Well, uh, well, obviously we were given, uh, similar to the Jewish faith, we also have a lot of rules and laws that kind of safeguard and, and kind of guides our lives. So we were actually given edicts that, yes, you can pray at home separately. Uh, for example, our Friday prayer, our congregation prayer, is, is the only mandatory one that we are supposed to go to the mosque on Friday. Uh, so that was done from homes, and we used to uh, transmit through the internet uh, the actual khutbah or the uh, sermon uh, for everyone. And of course, when things began to ease a little bit and we went to 50% capacity, then we utilized the technology where we split the community. So at one point, we had an age limit. Uh, the young, you know, on both sides, you know, that we had no one under certain age and no one above certain age just to be safe. Following the guidelines, uh, in this case, with face masks, uh, our prayers at the mosque typically were supposed to stand shoulder to shoulder, uh, you know, in lines. Obviously, that is not possible so we went to the distance so everybody brings their own prayer rock you have to make advanced reservations so we can control the numbers and then you would get a code that we would scan it at the entrance uh, when you come in uh, each one would sit separately with their own prayer rock you can only perform certain prayers so you don't prolong uh, your presence in the mosque uh, I, I can tell you for somebody like me that was totally depressing for lack of better words, you know, because, you know, even the sermon, you know, on Friday to this day, we still, the imam still has to have the mask on their face, even though they're standing enough distance from everybody else, but we just wanted to set an example and not break any rules. So there was, we had to kind of change the way we do things, uh, you know, and, and now we were beginning to ease a little bit. Of course, last year was the first Ramadan. We're, we're a lot more, even more attached to the mosques during the month of Ramadan, we could not even go near the mosque. Uh, pilgrimage, we were talking about that before the session started, uh, you know, going to Mecca and Saudi Arabia, that was also stopped. So, you know, we just had to contend with a lot of changes, but locally here, we, I think there's enough uh, bond uh, between us as a community here. It is a good sized community uh, in the Capel area. That, of course, thank you, thank God for the internet. It does come in handy sometimes when you still can communicate with people via Zoom and all that like this. So there's plus and minuses, but this is one of the pluses, I guess, you know, for the internet and social media. So and, and all in all, we, we just have to readjust our lifestyles and, and uh, have more appreciation, I guess, for things that we've taken for granted. Thank you. Um, that's, that's very interesting. The other, the additional technology you talked about, about reservations and showing a, a code and everything, that's, that's, that's very interesting. Let me ask Rabbi Rothman, can you share how, um, you shared a little how our congregation was impacted, but also how we conducted the prayer services uh, during the, the pandemic. So in addition to the restrictions that we might have on the Sabbath, 
There's also um, certain prayers that you can only say in the company of 10 Jews. In the Hebrew, the word is minyan, which means a quorum. So, you know, we, the, our movement, our, the conservative movement, which is one of them, sort of the moderate movement of Judaism, had published a paper a couple of years ago saying, you, you cannot form a minion, you cannot form a quorum online, not possible. So here we are a couple of years after that decision, um, you know, because people knew the question was going to be asked, deciding almost immediately that we were going to suspend that and that we were going to conduct our daily services on Zoom um, and that our weekly services, our Shabbat services, which were a little bit more well attended, um, would be conducted by a, the clergy in the synagogue and there would be uh, cameras from the synagogue that we broadcast in the service, either on Zoom or on Facebook Live. Um, you know, it's it's been an interesting and challenging journey. Um, you know, our our services, I'm sure, like many of you, involve multiple people doing things with different ritual objects, and so having to figure out, you know, how to use three or four cameras um, over the course of one service has been a real, you know, real drain on our on our time, and it's much much harder to do pretty much anything these days. Um, and at the same time, you know, I've seen some remarkable things. One of the stories that I like to tell is about one of the first evenings that we had that online service during the week. And uh, typically the people who attend the services during the week are mourners. There's a special prayer that mourners say called the Mourner's Kaddish, which is a, a prayer offered in praise of God, despite the fact that we've offered loss. And it has to be said with 10 other Jews, right? Because the whole point is that the community is supposed to gather around this grieving family and hold them and support them at this difficult time. So here we are in our different Zoom windows, uh, and this family had just lost a loved one. And, um, you know, they said that the prayer, which we had decided we were going to say, despite the fact we couldn't be in the same place. And then what we saw at the end of the service was, one by one, each of the people in the window said something individually to the mourners. Um, which was extraordinary and powerful. You know, if if you're in the in the room, um, sure, you may you know kind of lean over and say, "I'm so sorry for your loss," and then you're going to sort of, you know, depending on how many people are milling about, kind of move on. Um, but there's something about the first of all the emotional valence of of the time, but also about the medium that really gives people an opportunity individually to connect with one another. Um, and we've seen some of those really powerful moments of connection over and over again throughout the year. Um, so as we ease away from that and go back into the building, we had our first in-person service for 50 people on, on Sunday at the end of the holiday of Passover. You know, I'm hopeful that after the year, we've realized what it is that this, these things are for, right? And we can be a little bit more um, open and vulnerable with each other in our sacred spaces. Thank you. Um, let me ask next if, um, Debbie, if you could share how the prayer services were conducted at St. Anne's, what changes did you have to implement um, and when you've come back together? Um, okay. Um, well, first and foremost, all of the Catholic churches in our diocese, which covers the Dallas diocese, which covers about nine counties are governed by our Bishop, Bishop Edward Burns. And so really we couldn't operate until the bishop really said, here's, here's the guidance, right, for all parishes. And then from there, the pastor, our, our pastor, Father Henry, um, then decided what does that look like at St. Anne? And so the biggest um, item on the bishop's first decree to all of us was we are dispensed from the Sunday obligation, right? So... Um, we do have services every day, but the highest point is, of course, the Sunday service or Sunday masses and that obligation. So to say it's di it's dispensed in the sense of you do not have to come. In other words, well, you can't come, um, which was a reassurance on one side because we knew that it was impossible to come. But that was a very, very tough thing for all of us to... Um, knowing it was it was okay because the bishop has has said that but to to say it was okay to not fulfill the sunday obligation was very painful and i know it was very painful for me and for so many as i'm sure for for all of you in your respective faiths um so we quickly shifted to doing live stream and i remember the very first live stream um, I watched here through Facebook 
and it was a very clumsy <laughs> live stream as as rabbi is is mentioning the we didn't have the really the know-how with cameras um but we quickly found people that said i've got this background i'll help um and so even the not just the the worship um but also the celebration of the sacraments uh, confession in particular that people wanted and desired to come to receive reconciliation often known as confession so that they could receive communion on Sunday now we couldn't receive communion in person that's and confessions can only be in person that is not something that can change um, so to receive a spiritual communion all of those shifts although our our leaders our clergy leaders were we're telling us it's okay for now. This is why the church has these laws in extraordinary circumstances that we can adjust. But like all of us, we had never experienced that. And it, it, it felt there was, a, there was a lot of guilt. I'll say that. Um, and, and very hard to, to move past that. So um, once Texas allowed for a certain capacity for um, worship service, Again, our bishop opened up, you know, he, he gave us the second decree where we could open up um, only during the day, uh, uh, weekday. And so we started to have weekday services and our our major Sunday services were still only online. Um, and even for online, um, the only people allowed in the church for online streaming were our clergy, the, the one guy with the choir, you know, the one guy with the guitar, um, the camera people and the person that did the, the announcements and I would go in and do the announcements when it was my turn um, and probably you know similarly um, as Rabbi was explaining going into the church and it is empty and we're having a celebration of the Eucharist um, and the voices are not there the bodies are not there that really makes the church and it really rang home that Yes, the church is beautiful and it is a sacred space and it is our temple, um, but really the people make it so much. Um, and to be able to, you know, when we were finally in person, what we were used to, you know, the sign of peace, um, praying with hands together, um, receiving both the blood and body of Christ. And we weren't able to do all of that. Um, so it was, it was a hard getting used to that. Um, but then now we, once we were finally back to Sunday services, I believe that was in mid June. Um, we still couldn't do some of the things that we're used to physically, um, you know, social distancing. You know, people were pretty good about masks and social distancing. Uh, but we still kept the live stream because the dispensation still holds today. Our bishop still has the dispensation. Um, more and more people are coming back. Um, last year, this time last year where Holy Week, I, I had this false illusion that we would be back by Holy Week and Easter and it wasn't so and it was very heartbreaking. So this year that we were back for Holy Week and Easter, what a joy it was that the church was as full as it could be given the capacity limits that we have. Um, but we are still in a dispensation, which is why we still offer the live stream um, and, and so that people know if you don't feel safe or you just cannot come, we are still in this together. Um, so it, it's been a hard shift, uh, but those that feel comfortable, we have an outside screen attached to the building, the church building. I so I yeah, have heard so, about that. Yeah. yeah, so we had, the church was full and we had as many as 600 outside. And we put wow. out chairs socially distanced chairs and we had another overflow building. Um, so I'm still riding on that joy of Easter from last Sunday because it, it felt almost um, like pre-COVID um, when we were all together singing, but with our masks on, we were singing, um, but we were at least in our each other's presence and in church for the holiest days um, and that meant so much. And I know that people, it, it meant a lot for people. And I hope that's a turning point for us. Um, as far as numbers go, when we first reopened, we were at about 30% of the normal uh, attendance. 
Um, and now with Holy Week, we're getting close to about 50% of what you used to attend on a, on a daily, on, on a weekly basis. Um, <clears throat> Carla, can you share how in your faith, um, your prayer and how you've conducted your prayer services, how that's changed for us, please? Sure. Um, you may be aware that there are Baha'i temples throughout the world and due to the pandemic, uh, they have been closed, but many gatherings are held in the homes of, of, of the people. Uh, with the pandemic, even home prayers were held via uh, video chat. And this space made it really easy, you know, very easy to invite extended family members, friends, coworkers, and even distant friends from other parts of the world to come together and share in prayer, uh, which we understand to be a conversation with God. And being that uh, prayer is spiritual in nature, it transcends all physical limitations. So that warm feeling, those feelings of just love and, and all these things we had physically was there still strong. Uh, I've hosted and attended prayer gatherings where there was music, you know, through the and remember to turn, enable your sound when you're doing Zoom, but there is the music and cultural expression because of the diversity of people and a strong sense of belonging, which is really wonderful considering the diversity of people. So despite the limitations brought on by the pandemic, uh, the experience has still been very beautiful. Um, and again, since the congregation of the Baha'i faith is the entire world, um, we have a very outward looking orientation. So we're always interested in meeting new people and uh, working, serving together with people. And um, as far as any of the difficulties that we've had, again, on Zoom in this process, it was pretty much, and has been pretty much a matter of just you know, laughing really at our video chat limitations and the, the crazy things that we had to endure. Um, just being so happy to see each other and hear each other. Uh, of course, the content of the material shared and discussed being that of the word of God uh, from various faiths as well, really lent a great deal of joy to the gathering. Um, and as the pandemic has lessened in this severity in this country, some of the gatherings are now held outdoors, masked and spatially distant, depending on, of course, the local health regulations and have still been quite uplifting. Thank you. So I think, um, Carla, you touched on this a little bit, but the next question I was gonna ask each of you was, is there, in your faith, a religious explanation for the pandemic? Is God mad at us? Is this a test? Is it a calamity? How does your faith explain the pandemic? And I'm gonna change the order up a little and I'm gonna ask Rabbi Rothman if you can address that first, please. Sure, so I mean, the simple answer is no, right? That, you know, in terms of, do we believe that God caused this for a reason? Have, have we sinned in some way and therefore God is sending us suffering? Um, I think what's complicated about this for Jews and particularly Jews of my denomination is that the, I, their idea of God is very fuzzy. And um, so for most people, the religious observance is not so much about um, a definite faith in God, but rather a definite faith in tradition and in community and in history. Um, so I think that's why the question has been kind of played down in our community. Of course, there are those who have struggled with this question, what do we make of this phenomenon in our world? You know, and, and, and Judaism has many answers for why these kinds of things happen. Um, there are those that believe um, that God created the natural order of the world and how it operates and kind of stepped back and left it for human beings to make their own individual choices. And they could either choose to live according to God's will or they could choose not to live according to God's will. And what happens when you choose those two things is also a, a, a matter of great discussion. Um, but, you know, especially I would say, and actually today is the, um, the very, very end of Yom HaShoah, which is the on the Hebrew calendar, the day in which we mark and remember the six million victims of the Holocaust. Um, so we hold them in our, in our memory over these past 24 hours. After the Holocaust, it became very difficult for Jews to point to something bad that's happening in the world to human beings and say, aha, you know, that's God working. Um, so that's a, that is a very much a, sort of an activating part of our, our, our theolog theological thinking um, when we encounter this kind of uh, suffering on a mass scale. 
Thank you, Rabbi. Um, Carla, you touched on this a little bit. Can you expand on, on the religious explanation uh, from the Baha'i faith? Sure, sure. Um, when Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith proclaimed his message to the world in the 19th century, uh, he made it abundantly clear that the first step essential for the peace and progress of mankind is its unification. Unity is God's purpose for mankind. So Baha'is ask themselves, how again does the pandemic help to achieve this unity? Baha'u'llah said that the well-being of mankind, its peace and security are unattainable unless and until its unity is firmly established. So from the Baha'i perspective, the disease is not so much the pandemic itself, but rather the disease is disunity. And the pandemic is one of the many dreadful symptoms of this disease of disunity. So in medical science, when we wanna cure a disease, we know that we can't rely only on symptomatic treatment because treating the symptoms won't cure the disease. If the disease is not treated, the symptoms return. However, if we attack the disease head on, the symptoms will go away. When the world starts to look at the cure for the disease of disunity, all of those horrible symptoms like world hunger, racism, prejudices, nationalism, inequalities between men and women, and world diseases like pandemics will dissipate. And this is God's purpose for man, to attack this disunity, which will not only eliminate this pandemic, but to prevent future ones. Debbie, can you share um, the Catholic religion's explanation? Is there a religious explanation for the pandemic? I think you might have touched on this a little in your intro, but yeah. you can elaborate. Um, well, like I said earlier, you know, we we really did shy away from the why is this happening um, so much as across time, you know, as we have proclaimed Jesus as our Savior to help us reconcile with God that that's we still need to do that you know and so um, our focus was on continues to be on forming disciples and that people grow in their discipleship because that will help you get through a pandemic and any other things and, and, and very much realize that there were people struggling even before the pandemic other illnesses and of course this is more wide-reaching and just a common experience that we were all sharing um, but just really trying to focus on what is God calling us to do and to be in this time that we show up for each other including people outside of our faith just to show up as Christians and be a light in the world um, which was experiencing darkness in that we believe that Christ would outshine with his light any darkness. And so the pandemic is not, um, is not going to be any different. Um, but then also, you know, of course, being very, very sensitive to the fact that people were actually very, very and still are suffering. Um, but how we unite that suffering for sanctification. So it was really more about that than the why. Um, because we we don't know why you know and and that can be just such a circular argument of the why you know um but really trying to bring to light how can what is god calling us to do and to be and how can we keep growing in our faith and discipleship thank you and um last but not least muhammad um is there a religious explanation for the pandemic in your faith Yes, uh, in our faith, actually, we are strong believers uh, that God created man to be put on earth uh, to be constantly tested. Uh, we have free will. Uh, we have been shown right from wrong. And, uh, and nothing happens on earth, even in the hardest sense, not even a leaf of a that falls from a tree without the will of God. 
So we're strong believers that everything and every incident that happened on earth and uh, the universe in general is by the will of God. We take comfort uh, in the stories of the prophets uh, from the days of Adam on, uh, you know, and, and we always remind our congregation, you know, that uh, typically even prophets were tested. Uh, with some calamities and some difficult times and, you know, the, you know, Prophet Job and, you know, Jonas, I mean, we, we have all that in the Quran. So we, in our sermons, we constantly reminding people of these things. And we actually have in our tradition that uh, the stronger you are in faith, the harder it is for the test to get. We have a concept in Islam that uh, God does not burden a soul more than its capacity. And, and usually that is, you know, so even in death and, and, and hardship and, and things of this nature, like the pandemic, these are reminders from our creator to go back to him because we tend to be closer to God during our time of sadness. Uh, and these are reminders for us that, you know, you have to kind of, uh, as we say, come down to earth and remember who you are and your uh, purpose uh, in this life. Uh, so we look at these as, as tests. And yes, we do look at them, and, you know, not that because God is angry at us, but because these are constant, one of the tests that we as human beings have to go through life to remind us of a creator and, and you know, the, the reason to do good and avoid the bad. Thank you, Mohammed. I'm going to combine the, Two questions, if y'all don't mind. Um, how has your congregation helped your members during the pandemic? And then also, how has your congregation helped the broader community? So I'll ask you to start, Carla. How have you specifically helped your members? And then has your congregation done something special you'd like to share to help the broader community? Yeah, sure. Um, and again, uh, the congregation really involves um, all of humanity. Um, but I would just like to first mention that the International Governing Council of the Baha'i Faith is known as the Universal House of Justice. And they oversee the affairs of the world community. And the House of Justice has put into place a process for communities, both local and abroad, to grow and develop in times of crisis and otherwise. This process allows a group of people to build their capacity to help themselves and others. So it's very empowering. Um, instead of having to rely on, you know, a particular institution way above to determine all the little things that happen, um, you know, decentralized. So much of the assistance provided during the pandemic, for example, has arisen directly from this capacity building process, this empowering process. Um, again, where a certain population can arise to serve in their area and not have to wait. And it is, of course, held at the grassroots level. So, for example, um, a junior youth group, which is a group of junior youth between the ages of 11 and 14 um, in the city of Westlake, Texas, they came together and decided that they would put to practice the skills that they were learning in their junior youth group. And uh, these junior youth themselves decided that they would collect food for the Roanoke Food Pantry to help their community during the pandemic. So beyond the fact that food was raised uh, for uh, the particular population they were serving, it's noteworthy to, to be reminded that the desire to do this came from young minds and hearts. Uh, so again, we see that sense of empowerment even in younger populations. Um, another story uh, was regarding the pandemic and issues therein in the city of Rockwall, Rockwall, Texas. Mm -hmm. A team of friends from a neighborhood in Rockwall were inspired to meet the needs that arose in their community during the uh, early stages of COVID-19 when we couldn't find masks and everyone was wondering how are we gonna get masks and they, they just weren't available. So they called this endeavor Mask with Love. A few friends became aware of the lack of personal protective equipment um, for local healthcare workers, as well as the need for everyone in the community to start wearing homemade masks when out shopping or doing other essential tasks. And these friends decided to work together 
to provide free homemade masks. So some friends sewed, uh, cut some fabric, some cut the elastic and they donated fabrics. And then of course, there were people who delivered the masks. And so more than 200 masks were donated in the community. Um, you know, it's, it's a small scale thing, but when you think about the fact that this is a whole bunch of people from various faiths, from various nationalities, races coming together to bring about this sort of, a, of an, an, uh, an effect uh, is quite commendable. And I think it's such a wonderful example and it shows that the power of unity and how when people come together, change can be made and it doesn't have to require waiting so much on, again, a larger establishment to make that happen. On a broader scale, um, it's the same concept. Uh, so it's not like we here in the United States have to go and help the people in Kenya. Um, the people in Kenya are, they've got it going on, so to speak. Amazing things that they're doing. The same empowerment process that's going on there uh, of community building. And you can see it, for example, in the Baha'i youth in Sierra Leone, Africa, have created a film that helps to educate their community about preventing the spread of coronavirus disease. So we're talking about youth here. We're talking about between the ages of 15 and 25 uh, had come up with this. And the impact that that has now on the country. Some children in Luxembourg were participating in Baha'i education classes, these neighborhood classes that I had mentioned a little bit earlier, um, and simply to come together to make cards to bring joy to health workers and others carrying out essential uh, services. Then in Berlin, Germany, um, they created, children created drawings on the theme of hope for the residents of a home for the elderly. In Slovenia, the Baha'is connected food delivery services catering to restaurants to also deliver to homes. And then the Baha'i radio stations um, throughout the world have found a renewed purpose uh, not just playing music, but actually acting as a source of critical information and an anchor of community life to those in rural areas. And in South Africa, uh, Baha'i healthcare professionals seeing potential in every human being to serve their society, have been drawing on the strength of the community to provide support to those recovering from coronavirus because of course we know of the mental ramifications and this long haulers syndrome and things like this, what happens for those individuals after that? So thinking beyond this, even when the virus is no longer in their bodies physically. Right. Um, oh, a disaster recovery network was set up on WhatsApp by a group of youth uh, right after that August 4th Beirut explosion. So just being aware of the various circumstances that are happening in the world, uh, partnering up with others and then effecting change. That's a lot of great things that your faith and your youth especially have done. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Debbie, um, in the Catholic diocese in St. Anne's, can you share any specifics on how uh, something you did for your members or specifically how you helped or I know, um, I know because I have a lot of friends in the Catholic faith here in Capel, how, how you continue to help the broader community. Can you share what you did? Yes, well, um, first with the spiritual needs, um, knowing that, you know, some communities, um, whether it's in our area or broader, didn't have the capacity for going online. And so one of those was co continuing to offer our, our Alpha course. And before it was only in person and we were able to reach people in other parts of the country and in other countries who said, my community is completely shut down. We can't afford cameras um, and I'm alone. I feel alone. And so to be able to offer that, that was amazing. Um, offering um, short online courses, uh, spiritual courses where I, you know, me personally, I, I got to, to do one and, and got to personally walk with people I never would have met from New York, Florida, and other parts of the country. And so that, that the, the spiritual need was one thing. Um, physically, uh, we raised funds as, as a parish, um, and that was our Be the Church funds. And so anyone that called and said, I lost my job, I can't afford groceries, that sort of thing, we had a team that was very quickly assembled. Um, our community was generous to raise these funds that were specific. We already have uh, financial assistance available just throughout the year, 
but this was specific a specific COVID fund. And so anyone that called and said, I, I'm just kind of down out of my luck. I just lost, lost my job like so many did and tried to mobilize that. Part of the, the Be the Church outreach was also phone calls. And so as many volunteers as we could get, including staff, to just start calling people. We started first with calling people ages 65 and up that were in our database. Mm -hmm. But then also anybody who referred anyone to us, just calling them, are you okay? Can you get out? Can you get groceries? Do you need a ride to your doctor appointment? Just things like that, you know, and just trying to be the neighbor to people. Um, we continue to have our, um, like say like divorce recovery, grief recovery groups online. And by doing them online, we were able to reach people we never would have reached that are not in our area. Um, so those were some of the things that we did. Now, we also partnered with Catholic Charities, um, Catholic Charities Dallas, um, with what they were trying to achieve in our, um, our the, the Dallas area. And so through them now, we have a mobile food pantry that comes the second Wednesday of the month. And people just come up to our parking lot and, you know, there really no questions asked. Here's, here's a box of food. Um, we'll be able to give out diapers um, for the next few months as well. So that started out of this. You know, we normally have Thanksgiving baskets, Christmas gifts um, for, uh, for those in need. But as we were doing those yearly things um, in 2020, we also realized People are struggling to obviously keep food on the table, not just for Thanksgiving, but day to day. And so that inspired the, can we link with Catholic Charities and North Texas Food Bank with this uh, mobile food pantry? And so that's underway now. Um, and we're just really happy that we can continue to find ways where we can just step up and serve um, right here in Capel. And, and you know, and dispelling the myth that Capel doesn't have families in need, and they very much do. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> we definitely do. I did research on that years ago. So, yes. Th thank you. And some of the things you said sounded um, similar, but I will let Rabbi Rothman talk about um, what we did um, at Sheriff Israel and, and in the Jewish community, um, helping beyond our own community, but I know one of the things you mentioned about calling congregants, our elderly congregants is something I participated in and did, but I'll let Rabbi Rothman share. Yeah, I was going to say, Andrew, you, I, you should answer the question yourself, but um, oh. I'll be happy to try and you, you do a much better job. Andrew is the, the chair, one of the co-chairs of our social action committee. Um, so is the driving force behind a lot of the things that we do beyond the Jewish community. Um, and many things inside the community as well. So um, for sure, you know, we're, we're a 950 member family synagogue, which is to say that we have 950 family units, which could be one or two or, or more people. And um, we spent a lot of time on the phone this year and, um, and making those phone calls in a targeted way, just like Debbie was talking about specifically to people who are uh, over a certain age and checking in with them and making sure that they have what they need Certainly, you know, when it came to technology, you know, we, we had a, before the high holidays, you know, the, the most well-attended and sort of the high status holidays of the year, we had, we put together what we called a Torah tech squad, which was a bunch of four or five, four or five people who, who called, you know, pretty much everybody over a certain demographic who we made the assumption might have an issue um, accessing the kind of technology that would be necessary to participate in services. And, you know, we had this humongous spreadsheet of, you know, dozens of people um, and whether it was an Internet cable that they needed or a specific piece of equipment that, that was required, we were able to kind of pair them up individually with one of the members of the squad to make sure that they had what they needed. Um, yeah. Certainly, you know, the Dallas Jewish community is a very resilient and resource rich community. So um, for, for those in in our community and um, in the Jewish community, both in terms of the resources that we have to offer our own members. Um, and then the communal organizations like the Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas, Jewish Family Service, which is actually a social service organization, not just for the Jewish community, uh, but also the entire Dallas community. They do work for everybody. Um, these are resources that we you know, have, have, have had for years and have, have, that we rely on 
as a partner institution uh, to work with them. Um, and then certainly, you know, our social action committee has done some wonderful things. Um, you know, we, 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 they continue their work, which is to say that they identify communities in and around the DFW area that are in need of our help. Um, and they figure out how we can help them. Just recently, there was a drive for folks in Stan Branch, which is about 20 miles south of downtown Dallas, 20 minutes outside of downtown Dallas. And, and in Stan Branch, they haven't had uh, running water or clean uh, sewer water for, for a very long time. So we were able to collect a number of supplies, which we brought down to identify 83 families in that area. Um, and, you know, and some of that was COVID related, you know, like hand sanitizer and bleach and things like that. Um, so those things are, are ongoing and we're always looking for the next opportunity um, and have had some ongoing um, endeavors in terms of, you know, economic um, uh, injustice and also homelessness, things that we've been working for quite some time. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, and I think, you know, what, what we, we for sure, you know, I think we, what we've learned is that the, the most like, you know, without human connection, um, without a person, without knowing that a person on, you know, outside of where you are is thinking about you and checking in on you and paying attention to you, um, you know, people can really spiritually wither. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's been, um, it's been very powerful to, to, to activate those connections among our community and, and beyond over the last year or so. Thank you, Rabbi. How do I do, Andrea? Did I leave anything out? No, that was fantastic. I'll, oh, I should I should say one more thing. You know that there was um on, we have these regular opportunities to give what we to give tzedakah, which in, in in Judaism is the the Hebrew word for what some call charity, but what actually for us is restorative justice, economic restorative justice. And a couple of months ago, we had a holiday called Purim, which is one of our most festive days of the year, and it's this commandment on Purim to give to those who are less fortunate. And we have a congregant that said, "Listen, you know, if if we say." We'll give a thousand dollars to the Jewish uh, food, to the food pantry, the Dallas food, North Dallas Food Pantry, and Jewish Family Services. Then we'll match it. So we raised thirty thousand dollars. So the the community has responded beautifully to these kinds of campaigns. Um, you know, really open hearted, wonderful, gener generous people. Thank you, Rabbi um, Muhammad. I I was really touched by you shared how your uh, the Islamic Center of Capel offered counseling services for your members. Can you share other specifics on how you helped your members and, and anyone else in the broader community? Uh, in our case, and, and it's probably similar to that, we, we, we have a tough time talking about charitable acts because we were taught that it loses its effect if you talk about it, but I'll mention some because we actually taught that if you give charity by your right hand, your left hand should not know that you're given that. So we're a little bit on the private side, you know, when it comes to that, just out of humility. And because we feel that if you get recognized in this life, then you miss out on the reward in the afterlife, you know, so we would rather obviously, so that's why. But I can tell you one of the first thing that we became aware of uh, is the fact that many people were struggling financially. So uh, we do have a restaurant, Kebab Uncle, next to the center. So what we did is we offered uh, free meals uh, for anybody, not just community members, anybody that came. So we as uh, residents of Capel we would sponsor X number of meals, would pay for it, and we would send the word out that anybody can drive in. Uh, and they usually have somebody standing outside between certain hours, certain hours, and they will literally hand you very hearty, uh, you know, meals from, from there. And, uh, a lot of other things we do have national organizations and all that that we also give to because as the rabbi kind of touched on we feel that giving to charity purifies your money it doesn't actually reduce your wealth in fact it actually blesses it so uh you know we give also to national organization or what have you but the only thing that i can think of locally was really sponsoring the uh, the council for free for anybody that needed that. And of course the free meals available uh, because of people's financial struggling at the time. Well, I will say um, before the pandemic or early in the pandemic, the uh, Allies Interfaith, we did um, gather um, some needs for MetroCrest Services. MetroCrest Services is a similar organization that serves Capel and Carrollton and Farmers Branch, similar uh, to Jewish Family Service that serves anyone in the community. 
And I hope I will say this now that I hope the allies interfaith in the city of Capel, maybe we can um, come together again and, and do another social action endeavor. Um, I think that would be enjoyable to do. So I want to I want to end. Uh, ho hopefully this has been enlightening for me. I want to end on one last question and a positive note. Um, and I'll start with Debbie. What are any positive outcomes or lessons learned from the pandemic? Is there anything that St. Anne's has learned and it's been po so positive that even without the pandemic, you might continue that? Um, for sure, internally, we've been reflecting on this quite a bit. Like I mentioned earlier, um, before the pandemic, we were a vibrant community. That it was always busy. And um, although we have a lot of meeting rooms, um, we were still just kind of battling for room at the end. And uh, I think this helped us realize that we needed to focus on the right things and be busy with the right things. And that we were exhausted from busyness even before COVID. And so this helped us really focus on what are the main things we really want to focus on in our community. And, and try to put more energy on that versus spreading ourselves so thin. So internally, I think that, so that we didn't seem so scatter focused, but more laser focused on what our, our mission is. So that, was, that was a really big thing for us. Um, but in other ways, I, uh, you know, that, that we, we can pivot as, as a church and we pivoted, I think fairly well to try to do something digital and keep that digital presence it pushed us to be creative, to create not just content, but community online, which is not easy to do. Uh, there was a lot of content out there, you know, um, these websites or these blogs or all of the news and media ab about um, disease and all, uh, everything. Um, so we, wouldn't, we didn't want to be just one more voice in an ocean of content coming at people. Um, but we wanted to be really intentional and focused on what we put out there and find ways to have community, even if it was online. And I think we, we started to do that well. And I think we probably would have gotten there eventually, but this really pushed us to just think outside the box um, in that regard. Get, to get online faster. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Rabbi Rothman. Um, what are some positive outcomes you've learned from the pandemic and any we might continue? Post yeah, I would, would certainly agree with everything that Debbie said. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the buzzword in, in uh, the re, re, professional religious, professional religion business for many years now has been the word engagement. So this sort of allowed us to focus pretty much solely on engagement, on making sure that we build connections with each and every one of our members. Um, you know, Judaism is one of the most ancient religions in the world. It's 4,000 years old. And, um, and that means it's very hard to turn the ship. Um, and it really takes um, an event of epic proportions to sometimes force our hand to change and evolve in a direction that people have been saying we need to move in for decades. So, you know, we've made a lot of change in how we do prayer and how we engage with each other. And, and, you know, we've decided, you know, that there are a few less sacred cows that we absolutely had to do. Um, and, and that's been really good for our community um, because we've seen that we can create meaningful, authentic religious experiences without holding on to every single thing that we've added to the service, for example, over the last couple of thousand years. I mean, those of you who've been to a Jewish service um, particularly you know, on a Saturday morning, you know, and walked out two and a half hours later and went, wow, you know, what was all that, right? I mean, Jews have the same experience. They walk out two and a half hours later and they say, I'm totally lost, right? So uh, being able to create intentional, and Debbie used these words beautifully, really intentional, specific, purposeful moments of connection, both in terms of services, worship, and also in terms of interaction programming really really focus um has been a has been a, a really helpful thing for us thank you carla i'll turn it to you what are the some of the positive outcomes you've seen or lessons learned in your faith um 
really appreciating the capacity in every human being, of course, who was created by God, um, which means that we have the ability to um, engage more with each other. <laughs> Interesting, the, the same word, engage, and um, to, to really get to know each other um, spiritually, that, that's we are actually spiritual beings anyway, so there's a, it's a very natural thing for us to want to move in that direction. Another thing I think that's been really valuable is this learning about this dialectic between crisis and victory, and that when um, things happen that are uh, challenging and difficult to deal with, that they are not always bad, and that they actually serve a purpose, they help us to get over humps. Um, a mother, when she gives birth to a baby, has to go through a great amount of pain and suffering before that beautiful birth takes place. So uh, realizing that this is a natural process, every bit, every bit as much as victory is, a, is very much a, a natural part of, of life. Um, having faith in the capacity of every individual, really, who shows a desire to serve. Also realizing uh, the pandemic, I think, has really helped us to realize that what affects me affects you. So maybe we need to work together. Um, and also, as Baola said, uh, one of his most well-known uh, quotations is that the earth is just one country and mankind is citizens. And I think that the pandemic truly made that quite obvious uh, for us all. Thank you, Carla. And Mohammed, um, can you share from your perspective, what were some of the positive outcomes or lessons learned? I think uh, an awareness of the other. Uh, sometimes we tend to kind of go through our lives, even when you go to the mosque for prayer, you know, it becomes a very routine, you know, you just go in, go out, you know, shake hands with somebody, hug, but there's you know, a lot of spirit behind it. I can sense now in our community, there's a lot more, a stronger sense of the other. Uh, there's a lot of care and it seems to be taking place. One of the positive things that we actually noticed uh, is because we expanded things from just not coming to the mosque only, now we're very visible on social media and utilizing the technology. We actually were able to bring in people that were not there before. You know, they, they were not mosque goers and, you know, they, they only came during Ramadan, you know, during one month of the year. So now that the availability of the daily sermons, we have, you know, a brief sermon in the a.m. in the morning at six o'clock and one in the evening around nine o'clock that is all broadcasted live. The Friday service broadcasted live. So there's all these things that I think are bringing in more uh, of the fold back into uh, the community and, and people that we were not even aware of before. So That's very positive. I honestly think, you know, it really strengthened, you know, especially when you're in a Capel area where, you know, you're dealing with an exact number of families. So uh, there's a lot more sense of community. And as many mentioned, and of the other, meaning just not Muslims only, but the others, you know, the, the other congregations and the other people, you know, just by sheer fact that we all suffer together. So that, that's definitely a beautiful thing. Because, I mean, again, in our faith, there's tests are there for a reason. So, you know, that's why we kind of take them with an open arm and we understand and, you know, it hurts. I'm not going to deny that. But, you know, I think we always look at the outcome. It's always, there's always positive that comes out of everything. It's, it's a good perspective to have. I want to thank all of you. We went a little bit over our time. It was a pleasure to attempt to moderate this session and learn from various faiths that has always been of great interest to me. I want to thank um, uh, Parvin and Muhammad and Patty and if Davin's on and um, for helping plan this. I would encourage anyone who is interested to follow us on Facebook. We also use social media. Our group name is Capel Interfaith. We try to have um, devotional services, interface services every couple of months. We have other ideas. If you have ideas, we'd love for you to share them with us. I also want to thank the Community Builders Organization. It was very positive and nice for us to do this together. Um, Muhammad, Carla, Rabbi Rothman, Debbie, thank you so much. It was a pleasure meeting you. Um, I might reach out to you um, in the future because I have some ideas regarding social action that maybe we can team about. 
So it was, it was lovely meeting you and I thank everyone in the audience for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. Good job, Andrea. Thank you, yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Carla. You. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.